This is The Bandwagon, a podcast about baseball and the outsized emotional attachment I have to narrative consistency. I'm Hannah Kaiser, a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports, joined as always by Zach Kreiser, also a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I just got back from uh, the West Coast. I was there for my brother's wedding, not paying a lot of attention to baseball. I texted you at some point and I said, there's been so much baseball news. What did you text me back? Just the Otani thing? <laughs> yes. Question mark, so, question so, mark. so that's where we're going to start because you thought <laughs> nothing else was worth talking about. But then there were some other things that we wanted to get There were other into. things, but that was after you got back. <laughs> I felt like there was more, but I don't know why. Maybe it was just the way the Otani stuff played out, foreshadowing of how that conversation is going to go, which was over a period of like 12, 24 hours. And so... Um, there were a lot of Slack messages that I didn't read is mostly the feeling I was getting while I was on vacation. Uh, yeah, so the story with Otani is mostly that, like you, he was in Southern California <laughs> and then he left. Well, did he or did he did his stuff leave? I I believe someone saw him at an airport in Japan. So I think he left. Oh, OK. So he's gone now. But initially, initially. The, the first sign that something was, well, I was going to say different, but not really. The first sign that things had progressed in the natural way that they should based on all the <laughs> earlier events was that his locker was cleaned out. Uh, so this was what? This was Friday evening um, after the game. Well, actually, from ESPN, ESPN said, Otani was spotted leaving Angel Stadium by two eyewitnesses around 4 p.m. Pacific time Friday after the game. His locker had been mostly cleared out. Now, I guess you tell me. I was going to say this kicked off a firestorm, but I don't know if it did because I wasn't paying attention to baseball. Uh, <laughs> did this kick off a firestorm or were people just like, yeah, that makes sense because he's going to be a free agent and he's hurt? Why? Well, I, I don't think it was a firestorm. I think it was just like the typical... Otani's doing what Otani's doing and the Angels are not saying anything. Uh, yeah. hopeful, I, I think in hopes of just, if you never say a word about Otani, you cannot offend Otani is I think right. the theory the Angels are following. But no, it was basically like all the beat reporters went into the clubhouse after a game. Otani's stuff was gone. They all said that. The Angels said nothing. And then we all waited till morning, at which point they said, yeah, he's done for the year and he's gone. So it's like, yes. okay, we you could have told us that last night. This has been a slow, real bummer decline. Not really. I guess two, two, two bummers that amount to a slow bummer of a client, which was the original um, the UCL injury. But then he hasn't been playing because of the oblique injury. So he tweaked his right oblique um, during batting practice on September 4th and then proceeded to miss the next 11 games. And so he was not it's not like. Everyone expected him to be in the game, and then he both wasn't, and his stuff was sort of disappeared. He he hasn't been playing. They have not placed him on the aisle. They have since placed him on the aisle, but they had not placed him on the aisle when his stuff disappeared. They, they have since announced that not only have they placed him on the aisle, but that um, he's not going to play for the rest of the season. He received an MRI on his injured oblique on Friday, um, and whatever the results of that were, I guess, that like it's not going to heal quickly enough for it to sort of be worth him continuing to stay on the active roster. And so he is now going to move forward with whatever procedure he needs to address the UCL tear in his elbow. They're still not saying that it's Tommy John. Which I don't I don't know that the Angels have any control over this anymore. So right. And that, right. As you the, say, the Angels but... may not be saying anything <laughs> because they don't know. <laughs> That I realized that the that was a um, a fraught use of pronouns because yeah. <laughs> right the angels don't know necessarily what the surgery is going to be and the other people involved namely Otani and his camp are not saying much of anything so they now I'm talking about everyone have not said if it's Tommy John or not for various reasons I did enjoy that um, Perry Manazian again Angels GM did explain what had happened on Saturday. Everybody came back and he was like, yeah, he's going on the aisle. He's not coming back this year. He's pursuing whatever it is that they need to do to address the elbow. And then asked about the chances of re-signing him as a free agent. Manasian said, that would be a question for him. Now is where I remind you, Otani has not spoken publicly since August 9th. It would. It would indeed be a question for Shohei Otani. I mean, it would be a uh, 
a futile question. You can't just be like, are you going to sign back with the angels? And then he's going to be like, wow, I did not know you were wanting to know that. I will surely answer it right here on the spot. However, (laughs) no one would answer that question. (laughs) No one would answer that question. Otani doesn't answer any questions, so. Do you think he will speak again this year? Otani? Yeah. No. This baseball season, this calendar year. Sure. I'll give it a yes. I mean, not like 12 months from now. I mean, like I between understand. now and Before December January 31st. 1st. Yes. Yeah, I, sure. I I think he will be one of the first free agents to sign simply because okay. he has to be. I am very curious how the MVP press conference will play out. Like, it's wild to me that they're going to be like, Shohei Otani receives the MVP award. And then I'm, 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 I haven't been doing this long enough to have like a super 100% confidence in my memory of this is how it'll go. But I'm pretty sure they do like a Zoom call or something with the award recipients, at least on MLB Network, if not with all of us. But it's like, at that point, he's going to suddenly be speaking to the media uh, well after we have a World Series winner, but also people are going to be like, so how's your elbow feel? But answer as if it is September or August. Like, there's so much ground to cover. I, I don't think we're necessarily guaranteed to show Shohei Otani on the Zoom acceptance <sighs> interview. Like, there definitely have been times on MLB Network where it's like, there is a still picture of a player who is a finalist. I don't remember any of those guys winning, but it's possible. So, you know, that's, don't count that's what I mean. It. Like, I wonder, like, will he have to say something if he wins the MVP? And if so, will people then be like, what's the what's up with <laughs> what's up with that game where you hurt your UCL? What's up with that batting practice where you <laughs> hurt your oblique? Why did they clean out your locker before the like there's so much ground to cover? It's just gonna be such a strange. I am I I I uh I hope that I am there whenever Otani addresses the media again. Okay. We didn't introduce this episode. We transitioned so smoothly into talking about Shohei Otani that I didn't say this is gonna be another postseason preview. We are running out of teams that have become assured of a postseason spot. Um, we thought that we were going to be able to let things settle a little bit more before we talked about at least one of these teams and where they are relative to the teams around them. Uh, but that will prevent us from giving you reasons to root for them. All right. But now back to banter. Uh, Heim Bloom got fired in Boston. <laughs> Heim Bloom got fired. The chief baseball officer, which is the fancy Red Sox title yes. for the president of baseball operations. Uh, the CBO hired, instead of the POBO. Yeah, Sibu. instead of POBO, the CBO. Uh, hired less than four years ago, which is becoming a theme with the Red Sox top baseball ops guy. Was pretty much hired as a departure from Dave Dombrowski. The idea was we spend too much money. We don't have a good enough farm system. Let's bring in a guy from the Rays who spends no money and builds up farm systems. So uh, I didn't think this was a good idea at the time, and I didn't really agree with a lot of the moves they made. Obviously, the one move everyone knows that Bloom made immediately after being hired was he traded Mookie Betts to the Dodgers for Alex Verdugo, Jeter Downs, and Connor Wong. It was a bad trade then, it's a bad trade now, but look, he was brought in to do that. That's clear, like, he was brought in to make uncomfortable trades, diminish the payroll, build up a more sustainable uh, team by having a farm system. And you know what he did? He cut money and built a good farm system, and then the Red Sox were like, actually, people are mad at us, we're firing you. And yes. Did I get that all right? Yes. It, I Like, saying it's a result based business when you made an intentional choice to reprioritize sort of the overall organizational health. It's like you're taking something, you're almost hiding behind something that sounds like a cliche or a tautology. Like when, when the, um, I think it was, I assume it was John Henry who gets, somebody said it's a results-based industry, but like, when you say that, you're doing that because it sounds like something that can't be argued with. But it's like, in this case, I actually do have some slight quibbles because that was not the job as laid out. I actually have some fairly 
complicated, nuanced feelings about this because, right, so the the general response has been like, this feels if rash, maybe more so than unfair, specifically because, oh, he had to trade Mookie Betts. Everyone's like, how could you blame Bloom? He was only brought in to trade Mookie Betts. You can't blame him for that. And I am both very sympathetic to that and also kind of feel like that we, more so than any other situation in which like payroll constraints are a factor, we give that one, we attribute that one so much more to the owner than to the GM versus how we do in almost any other situation. Like we are so willing to divorce that move from Heimblum's specific tenure in a way that like, well, in that case, a lot of front office decisions should actually be attributed to the owners because everything is being made with an eye towards the bottom line. If not specifically to save money, then certainly like money is a factor in all of the decisions that are being made. So on that sense, I guess I am more critical than than some of the media are of um, Heimblum's tenure because I kind of feel like, yeah, that was part of the job. And like you said, the return on the trade hasn't been great. So not doing say, a good job at that trade is kind of doing a bad job. There were a lot of ways you could have done better at that trade right. if you're judging him based on the trade. So you, there's, it's really hard to find a comparison for Mookie Betts because he's better than all the guys I'm about to say. But the Cleveland Guardians got a better return for Francisco Lindor than and Carlos Carrasco. Who's, it was a somewhat sim- similar situation. They sent a pitcher who was a little older on a contract they didn't want anymore alongside their star. So the David Price contract was bigger, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, Andres Jimenez and Ahmed Rosario, Ahmed Rosario fell off. But overall, that trade is much better than the Red Sox trade. Right. So that's kind of my point. It's like, right, we there's no reason to necessarily say like, well, that one doesn't count just because it involved doing something at the behest of ownership. Like essentially everything like GMs do is in some ways at the behest of ownership and your job as a, he keeps saying GM, you know what I mean, a head of baseball ops, is to do the most with that. Like you, you are like every, every job really almost anywhere, unless you are like the literal president of the United States involves dealing with the sort of the the specifications that have been handed down to you and maximizing them. And if you don't do that, you're you're not good at the job. But that, okay, now to counter my own point. So that makes it sound like I'm like, oh yeah, he was bad at his job, fire him. The flip side of that is this, and I want to talk about, I'm going to sort of like bring this back when we get to the Padre stuff because it, the AJ Preller situation feels not so much similar as it is an interesting additional data point. Like the Red Sox feel like um, because like you said, the, the, the farm system has gotten better. The payroll has gotten lower. The results have sometimes been there, sometimes not entering Thursday's doubleheader against the Yankees. That's when he got fired. The Red Sox were 267 and 262 under Heimblum. So basically they were a little bit better than 500 under his tenure. If that's not good enough, sort of in conjunction with the, the system being better and the payroll being lower, I, now, suddenly, I am sympathetic to the vagaries of baseball and injuries and bad luck. And it does, like, when someone who has a, if only slightly, better than 500 record and who has accomplished the other things that ownership set out to them for them to do gets fired, I am suddenly become very suspicious of, like, how much of this is random? <laughs> like, if they had won, like, five more games this year, would he not get fired? And then if they, like, went on an incredible tear next year and, like made it to the ALCS, would he be extended for five years? Like, it's like, it does feel like um, baseball executives are in a weird position between not having actually as much control as we think because ownership has a lot of control and not actually having as much control as we think because the players are determining a lot and like what's happening with them on like a health basis and a I don't know, also just like a divisional basis. They play in a very difficult division. <laughs> well, I was going to say, he made the playoffs once, went to the ALCS, the other. It's worse because they finished last in the right. other seasons and could finish last again this year. And they just wouldn't finish last in any other division. If if he had finished third twice and done the same thing 
going to the playoffs. I don't know. I right. I don't think he'd be fired. I don't, you know, it's hard to say, but they, yes, they did fire Dombrowski one year after he won the World <laughs> Series and was Fair. in third, so maybe he would still be fired. Not sure. That's kind of my point, is that, like, he, I mean, he would be he would be in second. The, the Red Sox would be in second in the AL Central. And, right, it's hard to imagine that, like, so so that's kind of what I mean is like it's on the one hand, I think it is fair to judge Heimblum on everything he did, including the Mookie Betts trade that that to me doesn't get a pass. What does get a pass is like, yeah, you know what? Sometimes those sometimes those jobs involve being, I guess, like a sacrificial lamb in some ways and like being the victim of a circumstance that could have gone differently. Oh, that I kind of want to talk about the Padre stuff now in relation to that. Yeah, but the Rays got a new stadium, so the Rays got a new stadium. Uh, well, they did not. They they they. Got, yeah. I actually don't really totally know where we are. With that they reached a new agreement with the city of St. Petersburg and Pinellas County to build a new one point three billion dollar ballpark. Um, they so these the agreement still needs to get approved. They seem very confident they are building a stadium in yes. St. Petersburg, which is a step forward from like the past decade. But a step back from building a stadium in a place that's better than St. Peter. I mean, like, in the immediate vicinity, not, like, to, uh, Mo- Montreal or something. I just mean, like, it does seem strange that... They're not moving to downtown th- Tampa. That no. they're not moving anywhere. They're moving, like, they're saying, like, on that exact site where the issue is that it's very difficult to get to. Um, so, we have years to talk about that because yes. it's supposed to be opened 2028. So, we're just going to breeze past that and now we're going to talk about the Padres. Okay. I'm going to do a little transition or I'm going to attempt to do a transition. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but like when I was thinking about this podcast, I was thinking about Heimblum and AJ Preller kind of in conjunction and specifically this idea of like, how much would you know about the job a baseball executive is doing if the results were different? <laughs> um, and the kind of the question of like, it's like if the Red Sox won more, Heimblum wouldn't get fired. That feels like a safe thing to say. Sure. So then by that logic, A.J. Preller should get fired because the Padres have vastly underperformed. But if he doesn't, does that make him seem extra culpable because he's not getting held responsible in some ways? Like, does that make any sense? Like, I was sort of trying to figure out, like, the ways in which we do and do not attribute results to general managers. It's like, if the team is bad, it's either like, because the GM did a bad job, or it's like, wait a minute, the GM did a fine job. <laughs> well, I think there's there are circumstances that uh, dictate whether we end up looking at the GM. Uh, in the Padres, you know, let's say GM builds a team. It's of a normal age. You know, it's not like the Mets with like everyone's 37. Uh, it's a normal age team. Everybody gets hurt and they're bad. Like no one looks at the GM and is like, right. Should have seen that coming. But the Padres, the Padres have four superstars, all of whom they have made various levels of either enormous financial commitments or enormous prospect capital outlay commitments to acquire. They have a limited number of time. And beyond the four superstars, they have several other big name stars who are approaching free agency or have signed extensions like one or the other. So it was crunch time. It was a win now team. Everyone knew that. And AJ Preller was the the only guy who was there at the start. I mean, he predates controlling owner Peter Seidler in terms of like being a character in this right. drama. He's been there forever. If by GM standards of a guy who's been to the playoffs twice and once in a shortened season. So when you have all of that, the Padres didn't have any major superstar injuries. Their stars are mostly played within reasonable standards. Blake Snell is probably going to win the Cy Young. Josh Hader had a great season and the team is bad. And so everyone's looking around like, I don't know who to blame except like something is amiss in the clubhouse. Something is amiss with AJ Preller or the whole organization. I think people would look at the manager in a lot of circumstances, but Bob Melvin is the most proven part of right. this team. So right. thus, yes. H.A. Preller. Okay, so we're talking about this now because there were two big stories. Uh, the why are the Padres bad is like the most interesting 
results based story in baseball this year. Like why teams are good is a lot less interesting than why they're bad because yeah. why they're good is they're trying to win baseball games and they have people who do it this at like the upper one percent of the human population. So they're pretty good. Why no, they're the bad Padres is right like, now are an mm. Agatha Christie novel, but we're only in the middle and never get to find out the end. <laughs> right. And there were a couple of stories that came out in the last couple of days, last two days about it. One um, in The Athletic from Dennis Lynn and Ken Rosenthal and one in the San Diego Tribune from Kevin Acey. I'm, I, w- I would love so much to like, I try very hard to not make, um, this is like a little bit about me. I try very hard not to make our podcast and my coverage, my like writing and everything I do on baseball, not media criticism, because I actually think it's really easy to fall into the trap of just responding to what other people are doing. And I, don't, I mean that like in a totally non-judgmental way. I just think that like <laughs> when you discourse about baseball for a living, it's very easy to just like continue having a conversation with everything that is published. Um, However, I would love to do that off mic with you because I have so many interesting thoughts about the way that these stories came to be. And specifically that like, um, now we're going to get back into like actually commenting on commentary on content and not meta commentary. Why a team is bad while very interesting is not an Agatha Christie novel in the sense that you're not going to be like, aha, he was not actually going to solve it. Trying to undermine them all along that like, and, and same with like why a clubhouse might have bad culture. If you want to drill down a little bit further, it's not because like some guy is himself uniquely specifically toxic and everybody hates him. It's like, they just don't gel or something like you mean it's like and maybe they're not gelling because they're not winning and it's like and and it's not to say that these reasons are like incorrect it's just to say that like you could whatever kind of hypothesis you have going in you can you'll find different evidence either in support or against that based on the hypothesis you have going in i just want to do all that throat clearing because i felt like from like a the broadest perspective the athletics article blames preller and the San Diego Tribune article blames Machado. And I don't think that these stories are necessarily at odds. I just think that they are drilling down into sort of like two different issues that the Padres have. And like, right, maybe if one was different, then we wouldn't notice the other kind of situation. So I actually found the the Machado focused one to be more interesting in that like it had substance I want to talk about because it had like facts and not just like people say it's toxic. That sounds like a criticism of Ken's article. I don't mean it as a criticism. I just mean like literally, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't have anything to say about that. Um, so let's, what stood out to you from the athletic story about specific, br- mostly broadly about AJ Preller? I I think, you know, it's one of the lines they, they had in there, which I think uh, we as loosely more loosely connected people than Ken Rosenthal and Dennis Lynn can corroborate that <laughs> the worst kept secret in baseball is that Bob Melvin doesn't really like working for AJ Preller. Uh, yeah. That is it. It's out there. It's that relationship is not good. It doesn't seem like they are on the same page. You can figure that out by being in the Padres clubhouse for like 12 seconds. So, that seems, seems like seems a problem. True. Fact like, check. I, yes. I, I, there's no yeah. there's no real way around that being a problem. Like you can say what you want about like the front office builds a team and the manager deploys it. It's not how it works anymore. The front office works with the manager to build a team and deploy the team in the way that makes the most sense. And the front office of the Padres and the manager of the Padres do not have the same vision of how the team would be deployed. So it doesn't work very well. I you know. I don't, it's really hard to figure out the exact ways that that influences a team. And I recently looked into the numbers behind the Padres being bad. And look, there's no way that you could expect this team, if they did all the exact same things over again, they'd probably score more runs and allow fewer runs and win more. You know, some of it is not, it's just not explicable. And some of it is probably bad usage or poorly constructed bullpens poorly constructed bench i mean you know there are issues that led to this not all the way to this but you know the padres probably came into the season expecting to be a 95 to 97 win team and does the disconnect between the front office and the field staff 
contribute to that being disappointing? Absolutely. How? I mean, no one, it's it's really hard to say yeah. without like nitpicking individual ideas that we didn't, we don't have access to. I actually always think it's really interesting when people like like medium savvy fans like to be like oh the manager doesn't do anything anymore the the front office is dictating everything and to that i always think like well the manager's job is different than it used to be but it is certainly like he is not unconnected to the front office you know what i mean like it's like his his job is perhaps to be more of a communicator and act more as a liaison than it is to like evaluate the best possible matchups but that is an important job and so you're right it's like it's like managers are not figureheads they are Im important connection points between the players and the front office and so right that relationship is important if only because like everything has to be operating optimally for things to go well i thought that the, the really stood out to me i mean you, you sort of touched on a lot of these things already like a lot of the just like straight up facts in that article were surprising to me. The fact that AJ Preller is the fourth longest tenured head of baseball operations. The fact that the Padres have had only one winning record in a full season under AJ Preller. Uh, the fact that if Bob Melvin departs and AJ Preller stays and hires another manager, it would be his sixth manager in 10 full seasons. Like all of that in some ways, I'm like, oh, okay, I see why you might think it's the GM's fault. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't I don't need people to be like also he's toxic but also he, maybe he's toxic um, yeah and I there were not like it was not toxic in the like uh, celebrity it, it was not an Ellen DeGeneres situation or whatever right. it was toxic in the dysfunction way not in the like he was you know abusing people way let's just right. to be clear about what that word means in this context it's more in the push and pull of powers that be with the Padres don't seem to be pushing and pulling in the same direction at any given moment, which leads to confusion. I'll, I'll give the this I don't think was actually cited in Ken and Dennis's article, but the the clearest issue that I saw with the Padres this year where I could say, ah, that might be a problem for Bob Melvin that AJ Preller created was he signed like seven guys to be starting pitchers yeah. and then that's not how teams work you can't have seven starting pitchers at a time really so they had nick martinez seth lugo michael waka uh, ryan weathers all of these guys sort of toward the back end of the rotation slash the front end of the bullpen and AJ Preller does not have to be in the room to tell those guys which one of them is getting demoted to the bullpen when he's signed to be a starter. Bob Melvin does. And, you know, I don't I don't know how that went, but I can't imagine it was super pleasant. Right. Uh, I thought that the most interesting front office detail was that they he hired this rugby guy <laughs> <laughs> and the and and quote some believe he is effectively a spy for the front office because he spends a lot of time like in the clubhouse and and around the players and field staff that seems like a problem i don't really know why but i i i you know i'm kind of like i'm on a whole story on that i want you to ask everyone in in the team how they feel about that guy because spy for the front office is a big accusation what is he spying on them about because don't they all have the same goals in mind <laughs> like, i didn't, I didn't get that much out of the spy accusation but the uh well i mean clearly that just illustrates the disconnect between field and club and right exactly spy. like why but, should you why would you like what could cause you to feel like the front office is spying on you when presumably they want you to win and you also want to win the most interesting thing about that to me this was he was hired in 2017 so this has been a little while but he was put originally in charge of the analytics department and it said he had a rudimentary knowledge of baseball which is just goo goo bananas crazy i mean yeah. there are so many people who want to run an mlb analytics department and 98 percent of them actually know stuff about baseball uh and you probably should have hired one of those people which i think the padres hired several of those people like two years later when they right. probably realized this wasn't working but yeah that i thought that was illustrative of whatever weird thinking process was happening when that hire was made. This is like the nittiest, pickiest point of all time to make. But repeatedly throughout the story, it was mentioned how A.J. Preller, like, 
innovator that he is passionately believes in pregame work against high speed velocity machines. And I'm like, yeah, all right, that's not. That's fine. That just like kind of tells me nothing. Like I was like, that tells me nothing sort of positive or negative. And that's not a, again, that's not a critique of the story because that's like what sources were saying. I was just kind of like, well, then maybe he's not as much. This almost like lumps in the uh, rugby guy. Maybe he's not as much of like a quote unquote disruptor as would he would need to be in order for that disruption to be effective. Like I'm like, yeah, like more high intensity training is good. Other people have thought of that, not at the expense of getting enough rest to be fresh for games. Like you're not, you're not new to like the reason these like high speed velocity pitching machines exist is because the industry as a whole has recognized a need for like more rigorous training. So if what you want is to kind of like zag when everybody else is zigging and in that way, like outsmart the rest of the industry, your ideas need to be even more <laughs> strange well, than yeah. just like high speed velocity machines. I think the fact that the high speed velocity velocity pitching machines came up is just more of a sign of Whoever was talking about that viewed it as a, oh, Preller wants this and other people don't. Right. Which just means that in a lot of other clubhouses, everyone's fine with the high-speed velocity machines. It's not like, a well, this guy's making it, making us do it. It's just, those are there. If you want them, go wild. It, it doesn't have to be this, like, the GM's making us take practice off of whatever. You know, it just doesn't have to be that way. Okay. The San Diego Tribune article opens with an anecdote about players not doing early work on the field in a game against the Dodgers in which they were struck by the fact that all the Dodgers players did. That stood out to me just because the whole point of the AJ Preller article was that he insists on them doing like way more pregame work than they necessarily need to. So perhaps they were revolting. Um, <laughs> and the issue, so now I'm quoting the issue, several sources say, or said they believe is a quote lack of engagement and then the story from there attempts to explicate how Machado by virtue of a lot of things his time with the team his status as a player and his contract is quote a man who has shown the ability to carry a team but has not exhibited the ability nor inclination to lift it I thought there were some really substantive things that stood out to me Okay. Quote, according to virtually everyone queried in a series of more than 30 conversations with more than a dozen uniformed personnel, including eight players and other members of the organization, there is unanimous consensus that Machado controls the clubhouse and sets a tone and personality for the team. Machado, of course, was like, no, we're all leaders. Uh, but unanimous is a is a strong sentiment. So the idea of a leader in the clubhouse is something that seems feels realer to me the longer I do this job. I think it, from the outside, like the whole like Yankees, you know, anointing a captain maybe feels like eyewash or maybe is eyewash. But it is true that that managers talk about like the that often if a team is underperforming, it's because, you know, they don't have a leader or that like what a young team needs is a leader to like get over <laughs> <laughs> the, the edge and that feels like a if the front office is operating too independently of the field staff perhaps something that could get missed whether or not Machado himself is at fault for not being a leader feels more tenuous like it is sort of everyone says he is the leader but then the problem is he's not leading and it's like well then maybe he's not the leader maybe you should find it you know what i mean like i, I kind of think like if he's not leading stop thinking he's the leader here here's my i am generally completely skept, skeptical is too light a word i, I am, know generally will call bull on anything that equates a team's anything to like one dude didn't say the right thing in the clubhouse and it's like yeah okay whatever like no one was upset with Manny Machado's leadership when this team went to the NLCS last year I think the problem is probably that Manny Machado hasn't hit as well this season and no one has hit with runners in scoring position and I don't really understand how anyone in any situation any player can make you hit with runners in scoring position if yes. you're Trent Grisham and don't hit any other time either like there's no there's nothing you can say you can talk about and, and there was this was referenced somewhere of like you know maybe the team does not focus enough on situational hitting and that's fine maybe that's true i could see right. that being a point of contention that 
they could work more on that might actually affect on-field results? Maybe there are some teams where a leader would step step in and say, hey, guys, I don't think we're hitting well with runners in scoring position. Maybe we should work on our two-strike approaches. Do we want to all take swings together and do that? Like, I could see how it might remedy the situation. Mm-hmm. I don't think the situation got there because, like, Manny Machado wasn't rah-rah enough for this team that is almost entirely old guys. But that, I th- actually, I, but I think what you just said is doesn't negate the v- validity of this because the whole thing with culture and baseball teams and also, like, long seasons is that, like, is it a chicken or an egg situation? Kind of like, it, do you need a leader to have a good do you need a leader to have a good culture and do you need to have good culture in order to win or do you need to win in order to have good culture and then when you have good culture a leader emerges it's kind of like well you definitely need good culture and potentially a leader to get back on track if you are not winning like the the ways in which the padres are losing which is like a lot of guys are performing individually well we've mentioned the run differential on the podcast before i can see how bad culture or the lack of a leader would uh exacerbate issues if what is happening is you're getting unlucky a lot or you're losing a lot of late games and it can be easy to feel like this is really depressing and we don't want to like come in early tomorrow and practice extra kind of like i can see how the with the like i can see how that works with the way the padre season is going less as a cause and more of a you're right like a lack of solution but a lack of solution is a cause uh, a solution would have helped Consid- a solution would have helped <laughs> yeah like, considering a solution to something if, would be great if the second half went differently than the first half we wouldn't be having this conversation so if they had snapped out of it uh yeah i did think sorry i just got to like two two Man- manny machado i want manny i want to think like this isn't your fault and that like even if you aren't a leader that can be remedied by somebody else stepping up but manny you got to help yourself so it's two 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 quotes i just want to call out a little bit uh Manny made clear he does not believe the Padres culture is a problem and for that matter strongly indicated he does not put much stock in the importance of cultivating a culture. Quote, what is this? College baseball, he said at one point. What is this? High school? And I just think if you're responding to a series of accusations that the you haven't done a good job of fostering like a enjoyable winning culture, being like, I don't need to do that is not a great um, counter argument. Neither is this. Okay, this is just one long Manny Machado quote. This falls into the category of, you've made it worse by saying that. You haven't made it better. (laughs) He said, I think we just didn't want it. I think overall as a group, we didn't want it as bad as Seattle did or as bad as some of these other teams. I will say that. I think everyone's at fault. It's everybody's fault. We didn't want it as a team. What? I mean, Juan Soto said the same thing. So I guess I believe that that's the reason. But I just feel like, Man, come on. If that's also that's not better than they were like, man, they guys think that maybe it's almost like Kevin Acey kind of alludes to this explanation in the article and doesn't say it explicitly, which I maybe would have, but like I would if if you just said to me, well, Manny Machado is not someone who can necessarily be a leader if the issue is not enough hard work because he's really naturally gifted and he's had a lot of success in his career and Maybe he's not the right guy to, like, tell you how to pick yourself up by your bootstraps when you're struggling. And if Manny had just said that and he was just like, maybe I'm not, that would have gone over better than just being like, no, it's not that I'm not a leader. It's that we don't really give a (laughs) (laughs) It would, no, that would not have helped. Uh, That did not help. I, okay, here's the, uh, the more than $100 million question. If I just want a yes or no answer. The The question is, given what we know about the Padres and the on-the-field record and the underlying numbers, if it were possible to just run it back again next year with the same team, it's not exactly possible, but close enough. If do you th- Would you rather run it back or blow it up? Which one do you think the Padres... Or, like, change it up. Not blow it up, but change it up dramatically. Which one do you think would produce better results? I I can't believe how good of a question that is. I think you got to run it back, right? I think you have you to run it back. That's, <laughs> the, that's the whole thing. It's like, 
You try and find a solution for the San Diego Padres that is better than the current team they have. What's Nelson Cruz doing? Can he come back? Because <laughs> he wasn't clearly wasn't helping either. They got rid of. They've cut ties with him pretty early. Maybe he wants to be. Yeah, because he was bad. Um. Okay. We got to take a break. <laughs> we could talk about what's wrong with the Padres forever, evidently, but we're going to take a quick break and come back with a bandwagon of the Milwaukee Brewers and the Houston Astros. Okay. I am bandwagoning the Houston Astros, <laughs> the, uh, the reigning champions, everyone's favorite underdog, <laughs> the Houston Astros. I, I like foreshadowed this at the beginning of the podcast. We thought, surely... The, they will either definitely be winning the AL West or somebody else will be definitely winning the AL West and then we'll be, there'll be a wildcard team. We don't know that yet. Right now, they have a one and a half game lead in the AL West on the tied Seattle Mariners and Texas Rangers. If they don't win the AL West, they will be a wildcard team. So we feel we feel okay including them in our, in our postseason preview. It is just, however, a little bit tricky to like speak to their long run of dominance when we don't actually know how they're going to finish the season. But I am, however, going to speak to their long run of dominance because perhaps the reason you'd like to root for the Houston Astros is you don't like change. Change is tricky. I get that. Every single World Series I've covered has started in Texas and ended in Texas. And by Texas, I mean Houston, to be clear. All of the ones that I wasn't there for also started and ended in Texas, but that was because they were taking Different place reason. in Arlington at the new stadium in the middle of a pandemic. Um, all of the, the, uh, the World Series that I covered in person started in, specifically in Houston. Okay. Uh, outside of 2020, this is actually their worst uh, season by winning record since 2016. They haven't had a losing record since 2014. Famously, they've made six straight ALCS appearances, and uh, in that span, four of them were World Series appearances, and two of them were World Series wins, and one of them was a World Series win that people don't have problems with. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no matter how you slice, it's still pretty good. They still did win the World Series last year. You can't take that away from them. At least not yet. We will need several more years to go by before someone is willing to <laughs> go on the record. Uh, no, I mean this sincerely. Like. At some point, I should have made you bandwagon the Houston Astros because I know that you enjoy a villain and the Houston Astros do a good job of providing that. And that's actually like a, if you're bandwagoning them as the villain, that'll get them pretty far. That'll, that'll take you all the way to the World Series. I enjoy them being just hit, like really, especially uniquely October dominant. I find that to be a fun narrative in baseball like the idea that everything is the, in the playoffs is a crapshoot except the houston astros <laughs> like playing their best baseball when they absolutely need to is fun that's been a fun little recent history uh do you enjoy that as a as a narrative i enjoy there being a consistent power uh i i like I, I don't really like when baseball gets super random in the playoffs. It yes. does not excite me that the San, St. Louis Cardinals once won a World Series with like an 84-win team. That just feels weird to me. Uh, I So I like the fact that, okay, this team seems to have it figured out, and if you want to win, you have to beat the team that has, has it figured out. I do want to ask, in the context of the term bandwagon, which we use a little more liberally than yeah. the normal societal we, definition. We, we use it a lot, so we have uh, to. <laughs> but are the Astros the perfect bandwagon team, or are they impossible to bandwagon? Because it, in the normal sense, like in any given year, yeah, you should bandwagon them because they're very good and they're very likely to be there at the end, which is exactly what you want from a bandwagon team. On the other hand, if you're trying to bandwagon the Houston Astros in 2023, you missed the wagon like a long time ago. <sighs> that is an excellent point. It is a little bit tricky to to make a it's almost harder to make a case for bandwagoning them this year in that sense. And this is responding to your question than it was like closer to the scandal. After the scandal, out? the wagon was empty. I mean, right. no yes, one exactly. wanted right. to that's root what, for them. That's what I mean. Like like if you had bandwagoned them in in like the winter of 2019, you were you were out there, yeah. You were out there, and and you were handsomely rewarded for that choice because you're right; they've had a lot of success even since. Like, and and um, if you chose to bandwagon them at the time because 
you were a contrarian, you got to really enjoy being a contrarian by being like, oh, what are you going to say now that they are so good? And that's fun, maybe, if you're that kind of person. But you're right. Right now, in some ways, worst time to bandwagon the Houston Astros because it's like now they have won a second World Series. They've just won the World Series. It does not count as bandwagon. Like it's it's right. It's like literally bandwagoning because they are it's the like you waited until it was champions. cool again. Yeah, right. Um, so well, the assignment was to bandwagon the Houston Astros. Man, I didn't have the option not to. So here I am doing it, telling you reasons why. Uh, Dana Brown is remarkably candid for a baseball executive. That's fun <laughs> until he learns to change it. <laughs> um. I don't know if this is a reason to bandwagon them or not, but when Justin Verlander returned to the Astros, I bet that was like the highest percentage. It's not the right metric, but more than ever, I bet people went, yeah, that makes sense. I enjoy it. <laughs> like he should be on the Houston Astros as a, that is, it didn't make any sense when he was on the Mets and it didn't work and it's not working super great now, but it's all right because he just belongs there. And I don't know if that's a reason to bandwagon them or not, but they um, they have a, a type. They have a vibe. He is that vibe, and he's a future Hall of Famer. <laughs> this is a completely random thing that I just noticed looking at their roster research page earlier today. They currently have no starters in their 30s, only 20s and 40s. <laughs> How do we feel about that as two 30-somethings? <laughs> you know, it might be... They they had a lot of success with Charlie Morton when he was like 38 too. Yeah. I, I don't know how old Charlie Morton is now. Maybe he's 38 now. But yeah, they Definitely tend to like not. either. I just saw that man and he is, if he is, sorry, Charlie. I'm going to Google while you keep talking. They, they tend to like either this guy just got here or this guy was on the 1997 Atlanta Braves. Right. Like they have one or the other. Charlie Morton is 39. Okay. Uh, doesn't look, a, with the doesn't look a, a day over 39. <laughs> 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 um, uh, among those rookies, or, or among those guys in their 20s on the rotation who are not Justin Verlander is rookie Hunter Brown, who kind of quietly is third in rookie pitcher war this year. He's having a pretty good year. Like the the ERA isn't necessarily reflective of that. And he's like had some bad games, which I think kind of masks that. He did also recently have like a, a no hit bid. Um, but he's having a really good year for, for a rookie. So that's fun. They have Framber Valdez, who is one of my favorite pitchers to watch pitch. Um, and certainly one of my favorite pitchers to watch pitch in the postseason and then listen to what he has to say after the game in his um, postgame press conference. I just, I really enjoy Framber Valdez. Framber Valdez famously signed at 21 years old. That is shockingly old for an international free agent for $10,000 <laughs> out of the Dominican Republic. And now he is a World Series champion, a multi all star. Uh, they call him La Grasa because of his fashion sense. Um, this is from a Chandler Rome article at The Athletic. Few seem to flaunt their good things more than Valdez, the Astros' swaggy ace known in the clubhouse for his love of shoes, suits, chains, and cologne. Valdez estimated that he has 50 pairs of shoes at his Houston residence. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of shoes. I can really vibe with that um, and more than 200 pairs of shoes at his home in the DR and I was like whoa we've gone too far <laughs> too many shoes I was like I am so with you from Valdez I too love shoes and then I found out that he has at least 250 pairs of shoes um quote that's not an exaggeration he said in perfect English uh and um I like this quote from Martin Maldonado Mike Trout once told me that he is the nastiest pitcher we have from Valdez I just enjoy from Valdez also big proponent of therapy so that's a huge reason to bandwagon them that's you know speaking openly about the importance of mental health especially in a hyper masculine industry we love you from Valdez uh I wrote about Martin Maldonado, so I feel like I could. This is, this is my chance to talk about that a little bit. The Astros, famously analytic y and also famously not loyal, keep using Martin Maldonado as their catcher, despite him being like literally the worst at offense, certainly. But also this year at defense by the metrics that like they measure, which is not 
to be clear, like all of them. That doesn't mean he's like a terrible defensive catcher, uh, but but by the metrics that they measure, bad. And they keep doing this in spite of having a way better option right there. Like they have this rookie, Yanir Diaz, who's having a fantastic season when they let him play. And they get him in the lineup in other ways. He DHs sometimes. Um, and he and he mashes when he does. Uh, but they just really love Martin Maldonado because the pitchers love him. He's not nice, which is maybe what you would think. You'd think maybe he's really nice and that's why they <laughs> like him. Um, <laughs> the people that I spoke to about him were kind of like, nah, he's a little, he's a little mean. Um, but they just really feel like he gets the most out of their pitchers. And I like that. That is a cool... Uh, so much of baseball is quantified. And we think of the Astros as being like the ultimate quantified. They're just, they're making every decision based on a spreadsheet or an algorithm or a whatever. Um, and there's no magic left in it. And Martin Maldonado is some real magic. Like he is, they, 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 or at least Dusty Baker, and people like Dusty Baker, firmly believe that the team is better when Martin Maldonado is catching, even though he himself is not good. And it is not not working as evidenced by all their aforementioned success. How do you, as a person who wants everything to be quantified, feel about Martin Maldonado? Well, I, I acknowledge there are parts that are not quantified. And the biggest one that everyone knows is not quantified is game calling, the, the aspect of... Uh, catching and pitching that chooses what to throw and where to throw it and how to get the pitcher to throw it the way that will work the best. And I think anyone, you know, no one thinks we have solved everything about how to quantify baseball. And that's probably the biggest thing that we haven't. Uh, I don't know that anyone's going to solve it. Uh, and he seems to be, if not the best at it, then something approximating the best at it. It helps that he's working with the best team at pitching for the past 10 right. years, but you know, I, yes. All right. Uh, so I will just say like, I think it is like, obviously we cannot quantify everything in baseball specifically because even if you are making the right decisions, so much of it comes down to execution and so much of execution comes down to conviction. And that is like, in a nutshell, the Martin Maldonado story, which is like, it's almost like, right, it's like, it's almost like placebo effect. In a way. It's like, if you think that this guy is the best at game calling and you, to your point, have very good pitchers and they have incredible faith in him and they think he is key to their success then they will have incredible conviction in the game calling he presents them with, which will probably maximize their ability that they already had. And um, I'm going to try to make this work as like a metaphor for the Astros. Let's see if it does. They're really good in October. They have a lot of experience in October. Does experience make you better in October? I don't know. It probably does if you think it does because you have a lot of conviction and you're not like, wow, those crowds are really loud. So maybe it would still benefit people to bandwagon the Astros. and. I also just like, I don't know, man. I have such a hard time like getting through my head that they wouldn't be in the World Series. That would be the most surprising thing to happen. All right. What you got? I'm here to bandwagon the Milwaukee <laughs> Brewers, who, uh, you know, honestly also have a lot of postseason experience. They had made four straight postseasons before last season missing by one game. Uh, this has been the product of the David Stearns era mostly, and David Stearns is now gone. He's going to help lead the Mets. He was technically been gone sort of all year. Uh, former president of baseball ops stepped down last year, handed it over to Matt Arnold, who'd been there for a while. So the thing to know about the Brewers is that if you like pitching and not a lot of scoring... Boy, do I have the team for you. If you like good defensive football, maybe tune into a Brewers baseball game. Uh, but they have fun, weird, good pitching. So Corbin Burns, you know him. He won the side young. He throws his very hard, weird cutter. Brendan Woodruff has been terrific for years now since he started really finding his way into his own in 2018. And 
Freddie Peralta has a pretty much magic fastball that he throws not as hard as you think, and it still goes over your bat. Uh, but they're mass-producing nasty bullpen guys, which feels unfair. Uh, th- the two to know this year are Joel Piamps and Abner Uribe. If you don't know those guys' names yet, most people do not. I did that. You're going to figure them out in the postseason because they're going to throw those guys in like the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth innings, and they're going to throw some ridiculous sliders in the lead up to Devin Williams and his airbender changeup. Uh, the other thing about the Brewers that's that I find very fun this year is I think they might have won the Sean Murphy trade, even though they at no point had Sean Murphy. Uh, the Oakland A's wanted to trade Sean Murphy because they're the A's and they wanted to be bad. Uh, so they, the Atlanta Braves wanted to trade for Sean Murphy. The only, the way they got to this deal, somehow the A's wanted Esteori Ruiz, who the Brewers got from the Padres for Josh Hader last year. And the Brewers said, sure, take Esteori Ruiz. We will take William Contreras, the younger Contreras brother catcher, and Joel Byamps, this incredible reliever that they popped out of nowhere. And uh, I, I haven't checked this up to today, but as of a couple of days ago, Contreras and Piamps had a higher war than Murphy, uh, or uh, way higher than all of the things the A's got back <laughs> put together. Uh which is not surprising. That was kind of the point. But just a incredible stepping into a deal that had nothing to do with them and walking out with riches. Uh, William Contreras is fun. He's one of the, the reasons you don't know the hitters on this team necessarily. There's Christian Yelich, who's better than he has been in a little while. Still not as good as he was when he was competing for MVPs. And then it's a bunch of younger guys who you need to worry about, which is... Contreras, it's Sal Freelich, uh, kind of dynamic outfielder type. It's sometimes Willie Adamas, who's been on this stage before. And they've also gotten some contributions from Mark Canna, who is hitting better uh, since he came over from New York. Do you think it's because there are fewer restaurants in Milwaukee to distract him? I was about to say, he is professing to enjoy the food scene in Milwaukee. And that is not unbelievable because i don't know about the food scene in milwaukee i'm not either. sliding the food scene in milwaukee no i food just think scene is great and more <laughs> i just think it's a very funny version of a baseball player like loving wherever they are kind of vibes because it's like mark canna in new york made a lot of sense and now it's like mark canna in milwaukee being like i love the food of milwaukee and i'm like okay <laughs> um do i think it's because he has less fewer fewer restaurants not necessarily lesser but certainly fewer, fewer. fewer restaurants options. to distract him probably getting home earlier yeah getting better sleep because it's like that's the other thing in new york all the restaurants are open late so even if you're a baseball player and if you love going out to eat you could probably still do that in milwaukee you probably can't you probably you probably just eat at the ballpark eat whatever they're making go home get to bed early hit a grand slam the next day and be like man i miss those restaurants in new york (laughs) yeah the brewers the last the the shorter cases i'll make they play great defense You will see some incredible defense in the attempted no-hitter bid that eventually failed at Yankee Stadium. Freelick went up and threw center fielder Joey Weimer and into the wall to catch uh, a ball that would have been at least extra bases for Anthony Volpe. Uh, And I think the Brewers are aesthetically one of the best teams you can root for. Their uniforms, the MB (laughs) logo, excellent, Mm -hmm. all-around perfect if you don't know look at the glove logo on the brewer's hat it makes an m and a b if you've never noticed that uh let the glass shatter in your mind uh so i think the aesthetics the stadium with the slide it's all you know it's a good place to watch a postseason game if you know we don't get this anymore but i think the most memorable pitching pitcher hitting moment in recent memory the last one really happened with the brewers when brandon woodruff homered off of clayton kershaw in the uh 2018 nlcs so That's my case for the Brewers as to why to root for them. The reason they're going to win is because Craig Council is an amazing manager. I was going to say, how are you going to get through this without mentioning Craig Council? I will explain that further in an article later this week. But I I think Craig Council, their manager, is one of the few difference-making managers in baseball. Like, really, really big difference-making. Everyone needs a manager, but I, I think he is 
a value in and of himself, which is uh, which is pretty rare. So wow. Andy's a Milwaukee guy. I think this is the most fan of anything. Your fandom for Craig Council is greater than I think your fandom I've witnessed for anything other than like, I don't know, good restaurants in New York City, omakase. <laughs> like I my uh one of my MLB network producers texted me like a Craig Council link and was like, Zach loves Craig Council, right? And I don't even remember when I told him about that, but <laughs> I must have. <laughs> I've probably said it on the pod before. But um if you're listening, Craig, not in a weird way, he just really respects your managing. Um do you want do you want him to come to New York or do you think he should stay in Milwaukee where he's like a Milwaukee boy and like there's periodically stories written about how he's like never stepped foot outside the state. That's not true. Sorry. That was a hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Craig the Council, of, who famously <laughs> played for several baseball teams no, I outside know. of <laughs> I just mean but like the tenor of those articles is always like he basically yeah. is Milwaukee. It's like um, he's from Whitefish, Wisconsin. He doesn't know any yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Craig Council could go wherever he wants and manage any team he would like, but I find it more satisfying if he stays with the Brewers. I I think he could handle whatever, probably. Uh, we don't know. Maybe he would really hate having 50 beat writers following him right. around, asking him stuff every day. But I, I think it's more satisfying if he sticks with the Brewers. We'll see. His contract's up after this season, and there is quite a bit of intrigue as to what he's going to do. This is so beautiful. Your love of Craig Council extends to wanting the best for him, even if that means that he's not in New York where you, a baseball reporter, reside and go to the ballpark regularly. So I just think that's beautiful. I will say, I talked to a player who no longer plays for Craig Council, and I'm actively deciding whether to include this in the written article because he was just standing at his locker where he plays for a different manager telling me, oh, yeah, Craig Council is definitely my favorite manager. Would go back and play for him anywhere, anytime. It's not close. Yeah. Definitely Greg Council. And I was like, you know, your manager's like right over there, man. Uh, but Aww. so I, right. this so is not just so a me thing. So it's not just you. No, you're, you're... not just a me thing. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I I feel like that was some really good, like, selling of this future Brewers article. I'm definitely going to read it. Your Craig Council article is going to be a hot ticket. If, if that does, like, the best traffic of the year, it'll be specifically because people are like, I got to read about this guy based on this podcast. Uh, that's all I've got for you this week. Thank you to producer John for making this podcast look and sound great. Make sure you're following both of us. I'm still calling it Twitter. Uh, if you've made it this far, subscribe to the podcast, the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review. Tell a friend. We have two more weeks of the regular season. We will be finishing out these postseason previews, and then we will be just postseasoning. Postseasoning. What kind of seasoning would you? We'll say be posting. We'll be posting. Would you say it's post posting season or postseasoning? <laughs> hey, based on how much we write during the postseason, it is posting. It season. is posting <laughs> season. I'm going to use that joke at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I hope you all didn't make it this far because I want you to think that I thought of it on the spot when I use it in a tweet later this postseason. <laughs>